I wanted to get back to our story time series. I feel like God's really wanting this story to come out, especially with what we've been talking about lately in Corinthians. Remember how we took that little pause and went to Corinthians 12 and 13, um, building up community and saying how important it is to have people in your lives and, and, and how important it is to be a person active and invested in somebody else's life. And so as we were going through that, Nehemiah just kept coming back to me. Um, how many of you have heard the story of Nehemiah? Anybody? All right. I'm just looking. All right. How many of you have never heard this story? Nehemiah. Slip your hand up. It's okay. There's, that's a majority. All right. So let's do this. Let's go in. Nehemiah chapter number one. And we're talking about when Israel is in captivity, right? So uh, King Xerxes is a very powerful person, has most of the world under his control at this time and uh, unlimited amount of resource. I mean, this guy can just make it happen. And so He's a historic figure, and so as we're reading this, kind of put that history together and understand that while this is being done, you know, here's a, here's a man who is really a captive, somebody who's been taken from his home, somebody who is being uh, kind of slaved out, if you would. Um, he's the king's cupbearer, and if you know anything about that, that simply means that, you know, he's testing it to make sure it doesn't kill the king. It's not got poison in it. He's like a guinea pig, right? And so his job is to just make sure that, hey, look, the king's got what he wants, but what he has is actually good for him. It's not going to hurt him. And so here he is in this moment having a, uh, I, I kind of, I guess you could say heartbreak take place where he's looking at his life and looking at where he wants to be and where Israel should be and where it actually is. So let's do this. Let's read this if you don't mind. Uh, verse number one of chapter number one. It says, in late autumn of the months of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Xerxes, or Ar Artaxes' reign, I was the, in the fortress of Susa. Han and I, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some of the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. And they said to me, verse number three, Things are not going well for all who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. You know, I know that we're not living in an actual city that has surrounding walls right now, but I do believe that if we were to look at the home in America, this could actually describe it very easily. I mean, we are in a, a time where our homes are in trouble. Would you agree or disagree with that? Uh, um, they're, they're constantly under attack. I mean, our children are just targeted and different things are going on. Propaganda is being pushed out. And I mean, you are constantly, constantly battling what, what society wants your children to believe. And now we're in a world where society wants your children to hate you. Uh, and, and so they, they want to put a distinction between the child and the parent to where the children and the parents aren't getting along at the home. And so we'll take you over here and we'll do secret things with you. And if your parents say anything otherwise, then we, we, we are going to take control of your life. And, and I found this to be true. Um, not everybody cares about everybody else's family like they do their own. Would you agree or disagree with that? Um, I love you, but I don't love you near as much as I love my own family. I sacrifice for you, but I'm not going to sacrifice more for you than I am my own family. When that gets out of place, the home suffers. Does that make sense? And so I, I have learned this to be the case with most people. And I want to give you a, a word right here that I want you to kind of really lock into your heart. Um, never allow your life to be dictated by someone who really doesn't care about the outcome. Right? Don't, don't allow them to get into your life and say, this is what you should be and this is what you should do. And then they're going to go home and not think about you the rest of the day. They're going to go home and, 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 and think about their own things. And is that wrong of them to have their own lives? No, but what's wrong of us is when we believe we should be making the decisions for other people or we believe we should be dictating how somebody else lives and have sole authority when we truly do not have them on our minds 24-7. We tell our teenagers this on, on Monday nights. You know, you're going to need to change for God, but don't ever change for somebody who's capable of changing themselves. And so if I'm sitting here and, and John comes in and says, this is what I believe you should be and this is what I believe you should do, and I spend my life trying to impress John, what happens when John changes his mind about the way he wants to live and what happens if John changes his mind about me? My life is in shambles. And so what we see right now is I, I think we could look at it and say, are the gates burnt? Are the walls down in our homes? Yes. Are we under attack like never before? Absolutely. And not just that, our churches are a byproduct of that. So we have broken homes under attack coming in trying to create perfect churches and it doesn't work. 
And so we come in and we try to say, okay, look, this is what we're gonna do. This is who we are. Let's get this program. Let's get you involved in ministry. Let's get you going. And, and, and yet we're not realizing that, that your church service doesn't matter near as much as your home service and what's going on in there. It doesn't matter near as much as how you're raising your children and how you're loving your husband and your wife, how you're lo loving the ones that God has uh, 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 kind of empowered you with and given to you for you to, to, to nurture, to grow with, and to go with. Um, I, I will say in our culture, community is dying and independence is growing. And, and so we're getting a lot of me focus. How many of you can honestly admit today with me that it is very easy to only think about myself? Anybody else say yes to that? Um, and, and would we be honest? That's where most of our arguments come from. That's where most of our disagreements come from. That's where our friends are feeling left out and unnoticed. That's where people are going through things and they're literally fighting hell on earth and we're not even recognizing it because we've gotten so focused on ourselves. And what I love about Nehemiah right off the bat is when they come in to his atmosphere, if you would, his concern isn't about where he is. His concern is about where Israel is. Like, where is my community? Where is the people I love in their walk with the God. Where are they when it comes to their mental health, their physical health, their spiritual health? And, and, and I'm gonna tell you right now, I think in our mindsets, at some point, we've gotta step back and start asking that question. Where is my home? Where is my wife? Where is my children? Where are they in their walk? Where are they in their talk? But I think we've gotta look around right here in Jeff County and say, where is this county? What is, the, what is the health of this county? What's the health of Sevierville? What's the health of Morristown? What's the health of Hamblin and Sevier and, and Cock County and all these areas surrounding us? Can we look at our society, our bubble, and say we see a healthy, thriving society? Or could we say the walls are down and the gates are burnt? Things are going bad. I mean, I, I, I think I've lost count, um, last count that I can remember is 11 people who have come through this church this year have overdosed and died already this year. 11 that's set in these seats. People that you have loved and cared for. People that you have, have, have engaged with in conversation are no longer on the earth. You know, um, we'll have some people in the second service. I think one of the guy's wife was found dead just a couple weeks ago. And, and, and we look around and we, we see this all the time. Last week, I rolled up on another wreck where a guy was beating his, his wife or girlfriend because he totaled his car and was mad she wouldn't get out and leave because he was trying to flee the scene. And he was just welling on her. And, and next thing you know, running through the woods, you say, well, oh man, how terrible. And I'm thinking, hey, what a call, what an opportunity. And that's why I think we need to learn from Neil Nehemiah today is he heard the state of his town and didn't complain about it. He heard the state of his town and got close to God and said, God, what are we going to do about it? And I think today, if there's anything that I want you to grab is, is we have got to, as a believer, we have got to, as a church, get beyond looking at me, get beyond looking at here and start saying, God, what can you do through our lives right here in this city, right here in this area, right here in this environment that you have placed us in? Because I'm telling you, there's a great work to do here. And, and I, I, I believe it when the Bible says the fields are white to harvest, but the laborers are what? A few. I mean, and I'm going to tell you this, you cannot labor towards someone unless you love them first. And that's what we dealt with last week. You know, remember the whole, if I could speak in tongues, if I could prophesy, if I could do all these things and did not have uh, love, then I am a gong and a cymbal, just noisy and nothing. I can make a good scene. It's one thing to preach that you love people. It's one thing to raise a hand and amen in a service. It's another thing to get off our tushies and actually go do it. It's another thing to put things out there and look around for ways that we can care, ways that we can have compassion, ways that we can build up, not tear down. I mean, I feel like, have you ever felt this way when it comes to Christianity, that it's more like the news than it is like a mission? Uh, we like to tell what's going on in the world. We like to tell what other people are doing, but we don't want to go do anything about it. We love to be the one that's in the know, but we don't want to be the one that has to go. 
You know, like, let me tell you what's happening in their lives. Let me tell you, did you hear what so-and-so did? And it's not like, hey, we heard, and we said this last week, we're, Thomas isn't here yet, but last week I, I made that mention that if you see a flaw, God's given you a call. How many of you remember that statement? Like, and and I, he, he's been bringing me trash out of the parking lot ever since I said that. Every time I see him, he's handing me a cup or a piece of paper, and he's like, I can't walk to my car without seeing trash. Here it is. I'm going to start bringing it to you because I'm picking it up. But the thing is, is in our lives, when we see that in somebody else, it's the same thing. It's like, hey, you know what you know about somebody? Great. What are you doing about it? How are you helping them and how are you loving them? How are you caring for them beyond right now, beyond hey, this, this going to church on a Sunday morning? How are you caring for them through the week? What text messages are you sending? What phone calls are you making? And if they won't answer the call and they won't answer the text, what door are you knocking on? How are you checking on them to make sure that they're okay? You know, I, uh, I, I know a few months ago we, we had someone in our community that, that kind of got a radar a little message saying something's not right with someone's health. And, and all of a sudden I get a phone call saying I need somebody to get to my house. And Casey and Libby go running over there. And there's that person literally gone, dead. And I hear Libby yank that person out of the car and start giving CPR. And, you know, and uh, I, I, I'll say it publicly, she was slapping the tar out of this person like just saying, come back and pray in. And they came back. You know, God brought them back. And I, I've often thought, you know, like, what if we would have been in, in a state of mind that day where it was like, well, we got so much to do here. You know, like, I'm sure they're okay. I'm sure they're fine. You know, that life would have been totally gone. And, 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 and literally, we would be in a different state of mind concerning the situation. And I think to myself all the time, and I, I have to evaluate this in my life and really make some adjustments, but if Satan can't make you bad, what do, we, what do we hear? He'll make you what? Busy. And I think we're in a society now and we're in a state of emergency in America. We're in a state of emergency in the church to where there is so much that needs to be done, but people are just, myself included, sometimes too busy to realize that we need to get out there. It's not about, hey, I'll pray for you. It's I'll go with you. I'll, I'll show up for you. I'll be there beside you. You know, if I were to ask today in this auditorium how many people have relationships that are very dear to them that are struggling, you'd be surprised at the hands that would go in the air. If I were to say today how, how many of you are, are in a mental battle or uh, are in a, a, a lonely state or how many of you are depressed and, and the past is haunting or the question of why is lingering and you can't figure out why certain things are going on in your life, I think we would be surprised at how many people would be affected. You know, I, I, we have raised a culture of pretenders and, and, and we're really not getting contenders, right? We're not getting people that are actually involved and real. So Nehemiah hears this state, and, and, and when they say this, the wall of Jerusalem's torn down, gates torn by fire. Look at verse number four. When I heard this, I, I sat down and, and wept. Like, that's heartbreak, right? I mean, where is the heartbreak of the church towards people? You know, I, I, I can, I easily hear judgment, you know, and, 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 well, you should get away from, and you should ignore or you know, well, they did this to themselves, and that's true. They, they made choices, but so have you, and so have I made choices that should separate us from God. But did God sit on his throne in heaven, look at his son, and say, well, this is their fault, this is on them, or did he look at his son and say, now this is on us, let's get this done, let's make sure that they have a way that they don't deserve, make sure they have a grace that they didn't earn, a mercy that they don't, they don't recognize sometimes. How many of you realize that God has really spared you from a lot of what you deserved? Anybody say amen to that? And, and, and yet sometimes I have to sit down and actually think about that to really that that's true is God has been not just gracious and loving me, but merciful in what he's kept from me. I deserve far less than I have, far worse than I experience, but yet the goodness of God has proven consistent in my life. And I hope today you can say the same. But if that is the case of our lives and we do admit that and we do acknowledge that, then it's time for our hearts to break for the sinner instead of our hearts hardening towards the sinner. It's time for our hearts to be called to them instead of our hearts being repelled and, and, and disgusted by them. 
You know, I hear people misuse the Bible all the time in trying to say that, oh, this person's in sin, I gotta stay away. But Jesus didn't stay away from sinners. He went to where they were. He hung out where they were. I mean, how many parties did Jesus go to? How many places was he there where the Pharisees would say, this dude eats with sinners, this dude hangs out with scum. Why does your master hang out with people like this? And then Jesus would say things, I did not come for the healthy, I came for the what? Sick. And I've been sick. Have you been sick? Anybody else got an uncurable disease called flesh? Yeah, but can that disease be conquered in Jesus' name? Yes. Is there a covering for it? Yes. Is there an antidote for it? Yes. On our own, we cannot, but he was able. And I'm going to tell you this. Right now in our society and in our church, there are people who are fighting for their lives, and on their own, they will not win that fight. There are people that are, that are literally just struggling to get by, people that are just trying to find one more hope, one more belief, and on their own, they won't get by. And that's why God established a church, to acknowledge him, to praise his son, and to make him known. And when Nehemiah heard this, his heart breaks, he weeps, and I'm telling you, I, I pray for tears to return to the church. Pray for tears to return to our homes as we hear news that our hearts would say, it's time for us to not, not, just, not just say, hey, I'm praying, but actually feel what they're going through, empathize with them, sympathize with them, and then be motivated enough to go join with them in their recovery, their restoration process. Um, I know that in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today without people in it. Um, there's been some good people God has placed in my life. Anybody say me too to that? You know, I actually driving down the road yesterday with Jordan, uh, I named a couple of them and said, I don't know what my life is going to be when these people are gone. You know, and, and now I'm just in this state of mind of praying, God, um, I, w- I would just love for Jesus to come back, you know, like just take us home. But even at that, how many of you can realize that most of the time when I'm asking Jesus to come back, it's out of selfishness. Anybody else like that? Um, it's like, Jesus, come back, because why? I don't like my problems, right? Come on now. It's not, I want to go spend eternity with you, God. It's, I don't like my problems, you know? And, And it's like, even my motive in going to heaven can be wrong sometimes and totally flawed. I once sat with a missionary as he prayed this prayer. He said, God, do not allow your son to come back in my lifetime. Let me reach as many people possible before he returns. And I thought to myself, wow, I have never prayed like that. It's always been like Paul or you know, even so come Lord Jesus. And, but what about, what about the people that's destiny is right now they're on a track to hell and that should matter to the church. Um, I sat down with a family this year and they were talking and they asked me, they said, is my loved one in heaven? And you know, the one thing I cannot do, right, is I cannot preach that someone's in heaven just to make somebody feel better. Like, I, I don't know. The only, only person that knows that answer is you. Are you on your way to heaven? And the only way you know that answer is, have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Have you accepted the gift of salvation? And the answer is, I don't know. And they started weeping and they said, I don't want to feel this way. And I, I, I actually said to them, and it might have been cold in the moment. I didn't mean for it to be, but my, my response was, I hope we never stop feeling this way. Because if we would feel this way in our lifetime while people are alive, we would make a difference in their life and try to tell them about Jesus. Um, I don't know uh, how many of you were here in 2014, um, but a pastor who was broke down at the time, he was heartbreaking, called me and my wife and asked if he could come stay with us. And so he came in on a Wednesday, he literally stayed one day, and um, we let him preach that Wednesday. And I was going through my journals. Um, Anybody else journal in here? I mean, you need to, because you need to be reminded of what God has given you. And so I went back 2014, and I found it. I brought it up here with me. And, and, and in here, he made this statement. He said, the closer we walk with the difference maker, the more difference making we do. And I was like, man, uh, we, we want to look at this and say the walls are down and, and the gates are burnt. But why were the walls down and why were the gates burnt? And it's a simple solution. Israel lost sight of God and started walking toward idols instead of walking towards their creator. In Romans 1, it tells us we become unnatural in the way we think, worshiping the created instead of the one who created it. 
We, we start worshiping the physical body. We start worshiping our lust. We start worshiping the things that our flesh desires, and we stop worshiping the one that gave us the ability to have desires, to gave us the ability to make these choices. And when that happens, things fall apart. And Israel's in the state they're in because they got away from God. And I believe today that, that we're not seeing the church make a huge difference globally because the church is more invested in what the church looks like than the and invested in the one who died for it, established it by giving up his life and then giving us hope by raising again. We're more invested in what we can build and then in building lives. We're more invested in what we, we, we can become instead of what others can be. We, we, we take the money and we keep it in instead of sending out. And, and what happens is, is everything starts falling apart around us and we start wondering why. And that's normally when people go back to God is when things fall apart. But what would happen if we walked with God today in the state that we're in, if the church today, the millions of people in America today that are sitting in pews and sitting in seats would actually take seriously the relationship with God, what would start tomorrow in America simply by a decision that was made today to say, I want to see a difference made, so I'm going to live my life connected to the difference maker. I'm going to spend time with him. I'm going to seek him. I'm going to look at him because it's true. You reflect what you focus on. And the more time you spend with God, guess what starts coming out of you and me? Him. You know, um, my wife and I, um, I, I, we've been open with this. We've been going to, how, how long have we been going to our counselor now? A few months, a couple of months. And uh, we're, we're, we're invested in some marriage counseling. And I know that's a voodoo thing to say, but um, I, I even know a family member asked her saying, are y'all having problems? And Jordan said, no, we just want to be better. The one thing that we have not really ever been solid on is what? You want to say it? Communication. That's exactly what I said. We misunderstand each other a lot. Any, anybody else married in the room? Say yes, me too. All right. Yeah. Sandy raised Howard's hand. All right. So, all right. There we go. That's why Howard's so quiet. No, I'm just kidding. All right. But um, yeah, it, it's, it, it's like there's such great intention. There's nobody in the world I love more than that woman. There's nobody in the world that I want the attention of more than that woman, right? Does that make sense? But because of that, I can overdo trying to impress her and read into everything she says. Um, my wife, if she got paid every time she got asked the question, is something wrong? Are you okay? She'd be very rich, you know, because I'm, I'm constantly, hey, are you okay? And she's like, I'm, like, I think yesterday even, she didn't get to sleep the night before. And like, I probably asked a hundred times and I got the same answer. I am tired. And in my mind, it means I've got to give her energy. I've got to fix this. Am I right? How many of you are like that? And in her mind, it probably meant leave me alone. Like, you know, what I mean? like give me some space. <laughs> All right, but the thing is, is so we go to our counselor and, he, and he, he, he started using this statement. We actually, I say it comically and we'll do it. He said, every now and then you need to kind of repeat what's being said to you and then ask the question like, okay, so I heard you say this and I heard you say that. You know what? You're given a chance for them to say that's not what I said at all, right? And then you ask the question, am I tracking with you? You know, and so we do that. I, I've been, am I tracking? Is this right? And then we'll jokingly do that. Now I found out that I, when I'm teaching the teens, I say it. Are you tracking with me? Like, are you, are you getting what I'm saying? But as I look at that, I think sometimes when I'm talking to God, it's a one-way communication. It's me doing all the talking, and it's never saying, God, did I hear you say this? Is this what you said? Is this what you want from me? Is this where you're calling me? Is this what you're taking us to do? Am I tracking with you? And so I, I know this to be truth. A lot of times I'll pray already having a decision made in my mind, hoping that God agrees, and without waiting on the answer, I act. Anybody else do this? You know, I, I, I can go to her and say, hey, what do you mean? She can give me the explanation, but if I've already made up in my mind what she meant, her explanation doesn't change my mind. Anybody relate with that? And the thing that I see in America is we've got all these opinions of God and, and sometimes they're radically different. Like how in the world can we be reading a book inspired by God, written by his Holy Spirit, and yet come to different conclusions of who God is? 
How can we ever stand and say, God told me to say something and then fire and brimstone somebody and really rake them over the coals and say some of the meanest things that have ever been said in the name of God. God is not divided today. He's consistent today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if he's a miraculous God, then he's a miraculous God now. If he's a saving God, then he's a savior now. That's who he is. So how in the world is the church so, de- de- I almost said demonized, but de- denominationalized, right? Maybe we could say demonized. I don't know. But the thing is, how are we so split? Because I feel like it's, this is what I think about God instead of saying, God, what do you think about me? This is what I think about the situation instead of saying, God, what do you think about it? So look at this prayer. I almost skipped this chapter in this story. But this prayer just keeps echoing in my mind. Read it with me. We're actually going to read every verse and don't freak out. There's only like seven more, all right? And I, I'm, I'm guessing that because I got tears and I can't see. He said, I, in fact, for days I mourned. In our, in our overcoming grief class, you know what we say? There's a difference in mourning and moaning, right? Like my heart can break, but it doesn't need to turn to complaint, Mourning will lead you to an action. Moaning will, will, will paralyze you, right? How many of you, if you got that, say got it, right? How many of you love hanging out with negative people, right? No, why? Doesn't it just like drain you? You know, um, I had somebody come and say, hey, I, I need to tell you my life story. I said, okay, I got 30 minutes on Wednesday, I'm going to give you. They said, 30 minutes isn't near long enough. I said, but it's all I got that I can emotionally handle. You know, their face went blank. It's like, I I, I want to hear your story, but the truth is, is everywhere you've been might set you up for where you are today. But at some point in the journey, it's got to stop being all about you. And it's got to start being about what God can do in you right here. So I'll give you 30 minutes to tell me your life story. If you'll give me 30 minutes for us to go to God and figure out where God's story comes into play. Right? And you say, well, that's hard. And it might be, but I, I can't sit. And I've done this hour on hour on hour. Just hearing negative stuff. So, I, I mean, I cannot leave Fox News, CNN, or anything running on my television. You know, even the stock market report can be very depressing, right? And so, it, it, I, I just cannot do it. At some point, there's got to be relief. Would you agree? So, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you are in a state of depression that you cannot get out of, ask yourself, are you mourning or moaning? We, we go for, uh, way further than that. We say weeping or wallowing. Like it's okay to pour your heart out, but it's not okay for you to roll around in it like a pig in mud and, and then wonder why you're not clean. Like, hey, hey, listen, if you made a mistake yesterday, weep over it, don't wallow in it. You know, don't, don't go, go, Satan wants to keep you so trapped in that. So here's what he said. He said, I fell, I, 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 I wept, I mourned. Look at this, he, he fasted. And he prayed to the God of heaven. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Fasting is not something you really hear a lot of in our, our modern day church, right? Um, and, and by the way, you probably shouldn't hear when somebody's fasting. Even the Bible says don't do it like the Pharisees do, where they walk around acting like they're all beat up and different things. We, we one time had somebody uh, uh, like that, that, that wanted to make it very public that they were fasting. And I was like, hey, bro, you're, you're going to lose the blessing of God. Go do that again in private. Like, go, go get alone. And, and, and by the way, there's different types of fasting. I hear people say, you've got to do it this way. Just like I hear people say that, you know, you've got to be able to prophesy to have the Holy Spirit. But we read in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 12 that not everybody gets that. Not everybody speaks in tongues. Are they there? And can that happen? Absolutely. But does everybody have the same gifts? No. And, and has the Holy Spirit equipped us where we need to be? Yes. Do you need to understand those things? Yes. Should you want to see the Spirit move in your life? Absolutely. Should we be open to the Spirit? Yes. Yes. Should we not take God and put him into a denomination where they say, and I've been in them where they say the spirit doesn't move like it used to. If that's the case, we're all royally in trouble, right? The spirit moves. You believe that today? How many of you believe the spirit's not a standstill statue? It's a, hey, let's go. 
Hey, let's prove to the world who God is. And that's why Garrett loves to go through your spiritual gifts. Matter of fact, if, if you're interested in that, you need to get with him. He will test you, right? Like he's got different tests and different things that uh, work out. But he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to fast. Fasting is a, a way to get focused, right? So fasting is not about what you do as much as why you're doing it. And here it is. I'm fasting. In other words, I've been maybe giving up food. Maybe I'm giving up, you know, TV for, uh, you, you can do it all different things. I'm giving it up so that during the time that I would be eating, during the time that I would be doing this, I'm seeking God. I'm focusing back to God instead of getting focused on other things. How many of you understand this? Yeah, if you go home and you say, I'm going to fast for a day and all you do is not eat, you did not do anything spiritual. You know, you got to get with God. And so here's what, here's what he's saying. My heart's broken. I'm mourning this. I'm going to fast because I know God's calling me. I need an answer. Anybody in their lives right now need an answer from God? Go study fasting and praying. And here's what he said. Oh, Lord, God of heaven. The great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. What an opening. Like, hey, I, I, sometimes you just need to be reminded that God is not defined by your circumstances. He's a slave, still believing in the great and awesome God. As if he was free, he's still worshiping. God, as if it was all okay, he's still seeking God. Hey, if you're brokenhearted today over somebody or things aren't going right in your life today in some shape, form, or fashion, then keep your faith and praise open. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Still believe he's consistent because God's power is not divine by how you feel. God's power is real today and today and more than likely working in ways you can't see or understand and so instead of being where are you God know that he's consistent know that he's alpha omega beginning and end who was and is and will always be you got to get that back in your mind you got to get faith verbalized in your life I mean it is easy for me to say life is hard and sometimes so hard for me to say God is good anybody else in the room today you know, I'll be honest with you. It's not faith if you experience something and then believe. That's not faith. Faith is believing before the experience, knowing that the God of the experience is going to break through at some point in your life. It's believing before it happens. It's praising before it's there. Let's not be the church that praises God once they get saved, praises God once we get financial relief, praises God once we get rest. Let's be a church of believers that's praising God now for the salvations that are coming, the restored marriages that are there. Let's praise God now for the addicts that are going to get free. If we we believe he will, it will change how we live today. And I think what happens in our churches is we're waiting on God instead of saying, I'm going with God. And if I go and step out off a cliff, I know that something amazing is going to happen in the very next step. Now, I'm not telling you to go get on a cliff. Uh, let's disclaimer this. But what I am saying is don't just get to the edge of your belief and stake your faith there. Get to as much as you can believe today and say, God, I'm going to believe a little bit further than right here. I'm going to open my mind to a little bit more than right here. You know, I, um, I, I, I really am trying to get into a walk with God in my life to where I'm, I'm walking as if it's happened and not as if it may or may not. Um, I will be honest, I don't really have many stories that I can say I am living that way. Anybody else in here, if you examine, who's got doubts and fears in areas of their lives? You want to join me there? Yeah, does doubt and fear mean the lack of faith? No, it means it's actually the warning light on your car that says you need a little more faith. Something's off. Let's be honest, our doubts, our fears, our worries come when we forget who God is or lose sight of God in the moment. Would you agree? And so at some point in my life, I got to realize that if I'm having an anxious day, I need to stop and spend some time with my amazing, awesome God. 
and say, okay, God, this is your day, not mine. But somehow along the road, I've made it about me. Somehow along the road, I've taken control of this day. Somehow in my doubts and my fears, I've I've taken control of my family and their health and their provision. God, I'm anxious today. And I know that that is a sign that my faith is weak today. So uh, anybody else pray like that guy that said, Jesus, if you can, will you heal? And he says, what do you mean if I can? He says, well, I know you're able, but help, help my unbelief here. You know, like give me a bone. And, and I, I've been praying, God, help my unbelief, because I have found as I examine my life, a lot of times I have unbelief more than belief. And, and that's got to flip. And so he comes in with belief and he says, you keep your covenant to all those who love you and obey your commands. Well, there's some, there, there's some uh, conditions there, isn't there? Like there's, there's some things that you got to understand. God is going to do the work he needs to do, but you've got to, and I've got to be obedient and I've got to obey what he's already told me to do. So um, it's like this. We, we live like hell, hoping for heaven. When we should be living as if heaven's on earth, knowing that God reigns here just like he reigns there. And that's why Jesus, when teaching, says, hey, pray this way. Your will on earth as it is where? In heaven. So God, what, whatever it would be like today, if I was up there with you, let that be that way today here. Whatever I would be doing, whatever I would listen to, let me hear your voice as if I'm standing in your throne room. Let me be convicted by the things that are leading me astray as if we are standing in a place where you're chaperoning my decisions today. I, I'm gonna believe Proverbs 15, three, that your eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And so God, where I go, you go. Where you go, I go. Let's get together today. Let's get this done today. You're awesome. You keep your covenant. So all I need to do is trust your word and apply it and believe it. And then it goes on and he says this, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for who? Huh? For your people. I mean, look at this. How often is the church getting broken and praying over the condition of others? Or how often in my life am I praying over my condition and the the things that I want? You know, like, um, I have found that some of the hardships I'm facing right now, someone else would look at as a blessing. And the only reason I have the hardship is because God gave me an opportunity. Um, We may struggle with the health of our son, but I know for a fact that there's ladies and men sitting in this auditorium that would take their son back or their kid back in a moment from death, even if they were unhealthy. And you know what? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to pay this debt and this debt for, for something that I own. There's somebody else out there that needs a car that doesn't have one. Are you following the logic today? A lot of the things that I've heard this said, the prayer requests we have now come from the answered prayers that God has already answered in our lives. And now it's created new opportunities and new challenges because of the blessings we already have. We're praying that God would help us build a building while sitting in a perfect building. Well, there's churches right now meeting in underground tunnels in other countries that are just praying for freedom to be able to get together. Are you understanding this today? It's easy for me to get look at my life and seeing problems instead of looking at my life, realizing that the challenges I have are coming from the blessings God has given or the poor choices that I've made. Agree or disagree, church? Come on, y'all are awfully quiet today. What would happen if we got on our knees and said, you know what, God, help me to realize the goodness that I have of you in my life and to desire that more for someone else in their life? You know, um, there are people right now that would love to hear from a loved one. And yet, maybe you're sitting here so angry you won't call yours. Right? Would that do a paradigm shift if we started seeing that even the hardships of our lives, there's good in it, right? So he says, hey, I'm praying for your people, Israel, and I confess we've sinned. You know what the Bible says in James? And uh, I think the church needs to get back to this. 
that where there is jealousy and envy, where there is gossip and hate, you'll find evil of every kind. You know what the Bible says that jealousy actually even is? Demonic. And I think we live in a world that churches look at other churches and they tear them down because they have more people. Or they have other things that we wish we had. You know what, what happens in our church if we're looking at everybody else's church is you know, we lose sight of what church is actually all about. You want to know what church is actually all about? Look around you. Make eye contact with somebody. That's who Jesus died for. That's who he lives for. And that's what he wants us to be about today. So the people. But I feel like if we're honest, there's a lot of sin in the church today. This isn't the most popular thing to preach in today's society, but the church has now made acceptable what God has always said is not acceptable. You know, I, I used to do an illustration that if this table, and we'll do it real quick, and we'll, we'll get through this prayer, and I'll let you go. Um, if this table represents God, and this Bible represents the world, and I represent the church, what I believe we see now is that the church is more connected to the world than it is to God. And as the world gets further and further away, are we still distanced from the world? Yes, but we're getting more distanced from God because as it moves, we lower ourselves. Would you agree? And I'm not saying we lower ourselves as we become less than, we're not better than anybody, but we lower our standards. What used to be sin, now we don't talk about. What used to be something that needed to be discussed, we don't want to discuss. Why? Because we might offend somebody. And we're more worried about offending someone whose greatest offense is to not know Jesus Christ than we are about being committed to someone who is totally committed to us. And as the world gets further, would you agree the church has gotten further? I mean, we have dumbed down our belief system. Now, I'm not saying we should be judgmental, but I'm saying this, sin is sin. No matter what we want to define it as and how we want to talk about it, sin is sin. And when sin is present in the life, then there is a disconnect between that person, us, and our Savior. Would you agree or disagree? Do you normally talk to God while sinning? No. You don't see, we're not sitting here. You're, you're probably not carrying out your sin while you're sitting here. Why? Because you know not to. Because it's, it's not acceptable. But when nobody's looking, that's when it comes out. Now, I'm telling you this now. We don't need to beat people down because of their sin, but we need to teach our children what's right and wrong. We need to define who they are through God's word and not through like People Magazine and, 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 and all the other people who are wanting to really put on them who they should be and what they should be. No, this is what God says you are. But we start talking like that, people start leaving. You start saying, hey, look, you got to get this right in your life. People start leaving. You know, and, and, and I'm telling you now, if we want our nation to experience a move of God, then the one thing we've got to do is get real about getting sin out of our lives so that we can be a vessel worth using to go out and to tell somebody else about who God is. We cannot have sin in the camp and victory at the same time. They don't go together. And I, I, I like how in this prayer, it's God, you're good. God, I'm praying for your people, but we, we have sin. My own family and I have sinned. Listen, sin doesn't count you out, but it will keep you down. And at some point, you got to get free. If we confess, what's he faithful to do? Forgive and cleanse. He heals, he restores, he uses he uses. 
I, I, I told somebody standing right back there by that back wall just this past week that you have got to get your hurt from being your agenda and make it the platform that God stands you on to tell other people how to get free. It's got to stop being what motivates every decision you make because you're bleeding on people and you're hurting people. You're saying things that shouldn't be said. You're doing things that shouldn't be done. You're passive aggressive in the way you're approaching people. And the reason is, is because you are wearing it instead of standing on it. And God has given you victory over it. And if you would get it off your chest and out of your mind, it would be the stage he put you on because there are others like you that need freedom, but you and I cannot lead people to freedom until we've experienced it ourselves. And at some point, the church has got to get back and say, we have been set free by Jesus Christ. You have been set free. And so if the son has set you free, you're free indeed. What did he say to the lady who they tried to stone? He said, where are your accusers? They're not here. Then go. Neither do I accuse you. But the last statement is go and what? Said no more. Did he say go be perfect? He know. He, you know what he was saying? Hey, you know what this lifestyle of adultery is going to do to you. Get up from here and never be adultery again. Never let that back into your life. I'm not going to condemn you here. I'm going to raise you back up here. But don't go back to where you came from. What's the Bible say? Like a dog returns to its vomit though, right? Hey, listen, church. Your sin should not be the thing that keeps you from service. It should be the, the platform that you get to serve on saying, I once was, we sing it, I once was lost, but now I'm what? Was blind, but now I, hey, a testimony is not where you've been. It's where God has brought you and what God brought you out of. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we sang it, hey, she, it's in there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved what? How many of you say that could be your story, right? Like wretched, 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 but saved, changed. You know what? The, 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 the ability to go build the walls and to have people follow you doesn't come from a wallowing mindset, doesn't come from a trap mindset. It comes from a mindset saying, I know that I am guilty, yet you love me anyway. So God, send me back to restore what has been broken. Look at this. He goes on and. He said, please remember, he said, we have sinned terribly by not obeying your commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among nations, but if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them. Will you say those words? Return, say it. Obey, live by you know, you say, I'm just not happy. Return, obey, and live by. Well, I just, I don't feel like I, I experienced God. Return, obey, and live by. We know that all things work together for the good of those who what? Love God and are what? called according to his purpose. You know what that's saying? If you return, love God. If you obey your calling, you're in what God has told you to be. You live by it. We know that everything will work out. You say life is terrible right now and I'm doing everything I can to be what God wants me to be. Then don't stop because in due season you will reap if you do not faint. You say, well, it's never working out. And I don't, you know, I hear people say all the time, Believe in God. What has he ever done for me? Maybe if you believed in God, you'd recognize what he'd done and you'd see more happen. It's not about God, show me and then I'll believe. It's God, I believe you're going to show me. I believe you're going to come through. I'm not waiting for 2024 in November to try to see what the, the outcome of our country is going to be. Well, let's hit our knees right now and believe that right here in 2023, a nation can change. If a church changes, a church can change. If a home changes, a home will change. If a heart changes, and at some point we got to get there and say, okay, you said if we return, you said if we obey, you said if we live by it, you will restore. So here I am. Staking a claim in Jesus' name. In my home and where I am, in my job and where I'm going, that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here we are. Then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place 
I have chosen for my name to be honored. There's a mindset. It can't be God restore me. For me, it's got to be God restore me so that you can be seen in me. I remember um, three years ago, three and a half, I don't know, sitting right in my journal and sermon after sermon was just coming to me in a season that I wasn't preaching. In a season I believed I'd never preach again. I was writing these things. And I looked at my wife with tears in my eyes. I said, I just hope one day before I die, I get a chance to take a stage again to warn people about what Satan wants to do to them, but to show people that God can bring you back. And here we are, and I forgot this. Like, I, I, There's been times in the past couple years where it's like, I want to give up. I want to do this. Anybody else have that give up in you in some area? That I have forgotten, and, and literally Jordan is so gracious to remind me that, of that statement where she said, I remember you saying you could not wait to be able to do what God had called you to do, and now you're able and you want to quit. What's happened? The thing is this, when, when you and I get that chance, we've got to know this. God will go to the end of the earth for you. And not just to get you, but to bring you back. And not just to bring you back, but to use you so that other people can either be rescued, delivered, restored, renewed, find faith, find hope, but greater than all, find Jesus Christ. That should be what we want to live for. So that somebody I come in contact with today can find Jesus Christ. Look at this and we're out. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. Oh, Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind. Now, if you don't know the next chapter, he's not saying, make this an easy day. What he's saying is, I'm about to put it all on the line. I mean, look at the last sentence of the chapter. I like it. In those days, oh, I love that password. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. In that moment, I'm nothing. And God, don't Wait, don't, 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 don't delay. Let me right now in my nothingness stand before a powerful king and let him be open to what I'm going to ask him to do. In the very next chapter, we'll get there. Dude stands before him and, he, and it says, I've never been sad a day in his presence. Isn't that something? Wait, is that your testimony about your boss at work? Right? Like, do you think he got up, Nehemiah got up every day and said, I am so thankful to be a slave today. No, but it was his job. So what did he do? He kind of had a New Testament verse principle in his Old Testament life of whether in word or deed, whatever you do or say, do it as unto who? The Lord. Do it to him, not to men. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. Let's, 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 let's drop a little bomb and we'll move. Ready? I mean, could we go to the places we work and, and, and witness or would our testimony from Friday be carrying over? With the way that we behaved and the way we talked about people, could we go to our school and tell our friends about Jesus Christ or would our language from the week before be a hindrance to that? At some point, if what was before is not where you want to be, go make that right and say, hey, you know what, guys? You know what, girls? I have been terrible. Go to your boss. Hey, you know, I've talked bad about you, and I am sorry. I'm going to be a better employee, and I just thought you needed to know that I went to church, or I was, I was, I was reading my Bible, and God got a hold of my heart, and the way I've been treating you is not godly, and I am so sorry. Thank you for the job. Thank you for caring about me. I'm going to give you a better, a better employee. See, like, what, what would happen to the atmosphere? of your workplace. If, 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 if this could be said, and I'm going to go a little bit further, he says, I was serving the king as wine, verse 1 of chapter 2. I had never 
before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. I mean, what a testimony. You say, my life is hard. Go out living your life as if it's everything you wanted it to be. And watch the impact of God work through you. To where, and and, and spoiler alert, this guy asked for permission to go view the town. King gives it. This guy asked for the king to fund the rebuild in a few chapters. And you know what the king says? Go to my lumber yard and get what you need. The enemy who tore down the wall is now helping rebuild the wall. God will even use Satan to accomplish his will in your life. Now, I know that's a real thing, but what's the Bible say? What men mean for evil, God will what? Listen, Satan's plan was to crucify and kill Jesus. God didn't change the plan. He just trumped it. He said, take him down. I'll bring him back. And you and I might have a story in our lives where where Satan's done his worst. And we might be thinking, there's no way God can use this. God loves to use Satan's tools against him. And I promise you this, that God will rebuild and restore. I believe it. I believe your home can change. I believe it. But it's not going to happen until we get real and we say, okay, God, start here. We can talk about community all day long. But absent mine and your willingness to be in community, it will never exist. And so at some point, we got to say, start with me. At some point, we got to get alone with the difference maker so that we can go make a difference. And so I want to challenge you today. If it's never mattered to you before, may it matter now that your walk with God become the most important part of your life that your connection with him and your openness to him become the thing you seek the most, I seek the most. Let's repent and live. Let's return, obey, and live by his commands. And let's watch God change Jefferson County. That's my prayer. I hope that next year, when we start 2024, we're able to say, we saw this many OD but so many more restored in Jesus' name. We saw defeat, but the defeat did not even come close to the measure of victory we experienced. We saw our homes attacked and rocked, but we saw some strong couples come out. We saw our men targeted, but now we see warriors of God. We saw our women broken and beaten down and wore out. And we, but now we see strong Esthers and strong roots that are changing the world by their faith in God. And, 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 and now what we experience is worth every attack, every hardship because of the change we've seen in other people's lives. That's my prayer for you. And I'm going to ask, would you pray for me too? Bow your heads, close your eyes, and one question, we're out the door. The main question is always, do you know Christ? That's an understood question we need to ask you because the next question, the only question that I want you to focus on leaving outside of that one does not matter if you do not have Christ as your Savior. And right now, no matter who you are, God's love can cover everything. No matter what you've done, God will receive you back. You are not cast down. He'll go to the end of the earth to bring you back. If you do not know Christ, then right there, the Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth that he's the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Your salvation is based on who Christ is and what he did and your belief of acceptance. Nothing else will save you other than the name of Jesus Christ. So will you confess to God your need of him? Will you proclaim him, Lord, openly declare the Lord of your life and let him take control? The question that I think needs to rock our church is this. Are you all in with God? Have you surrendered everything? Or are there secrets in your life? Are there hidden things? 
Is it God, I'll give you everything, but I'm going to hold on to this? Or is it God, I'm going to give you everything, and I, 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 I got I to gotta get some help on this, God. I got to get through this. Is there anybody here today that says and, and, and would make it a clear, it's not to me, to God. Don't raise your hand. Don't do anything. It's of the heart. I don't need to know because you may lie to me, but I want you to get real. Is there anybody today that needs to come to God and say, hey, I've sinned. I've got this in my life. I've given it up. I, I, I've lost focus of you, God. Or, hey, you know what? I haven't been making the time for you. I need to. So, God, my heart is moved in your direction. So here's my life. I surrender. Are you all in with God? Because until we are, the hope of the world is in his name and his name is hidden. If we're not obeying his commands, following his regulations and doing the things that God has called us to do, are you all in? And if the answer is no, change that. Do you love and desire God more than anything else? If the answer is no, change that. Find a way to spend a little bit of time with him today, a little bit more than you normally do. Do it tomorrow. Build a habit of seeking God. Build a habit of praying. Build a habit of believing before you see. Build a habit of proclaiming verbally your faith. Build a habit of getting out there and being proud to be a child of God. Build a habit and doing the right thing. Because people's lives in eternity depend on the church of the living God to come back to him. Stand with me, grab somebody's head, and let's close in a word of prayer. Amen. Travis, would you come lead us in prayer as we close today? It's one of our deacons here. I'll let you get to know him. Will you all say a prayer for me? Because I feel like I'm going to pass out right now. Like, uh, I am not feeling too good. That as we go to the next service, that whatever God wills on that would happen. Um, is there anybody else in the room that's their heart's just beating to see a change in our community? Is there anybody else? Like I, solid homes, kids excited about God. It's gonna. It's only gonna happen if we, me. We go all in with him. Father, I thank you for this message that you've given us today. I ask that you would you would strengthen Josh, that you would hold him up with your righteous right hand. Father, I ask that you would soften our hearts, that we would we would put ourselves aside so that we would care for others the way the way that we should, Father, that we would seek your will first and that we would make your will our will, Father, that we would not only listen to the words that were spoke today, but we would put them into action, that we would we would long for your word, we would we would seek it with all that we are, Father, and that we would we would do it. We would show yourself in the love that we give others in our actions, Father. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.